Hello, folks. So that Andromeda galaxy you just saw was captured with this setup, a setup I had abandoned a couple of years ago, and now I'm scratching my head wondering why I stopped using it, because I liked how that data looked once I went back to reprocess it. And I also reprocessed the Trippin, the Trippin and Lagoon Nebula that was captured with this, and that was only two hours of data, and I thought it looked great. You know, if I don't say so myself, the Andromeda Galaxy was six hours. And, you know, I, I was actually thinking about selling back or trading in this one-shot color camera, the QHY10. And now after seeing that data, there's no way I'm trading this. And I really like the results. In fact, I actually have a complete setup here. I was using this wide field scope for solar mostly. But I have a complete setup that could do those kind of images again, right? Sitting right here, all I would need is another mount because I don't want to tear down my current primary setup. I, I'd rather, if I feel like doing wide field one shot color, I'd rather just be able to roll out a setup ready to go and not tear anything down. So, but for anyone who's doing this hobby, I was just going to show you all the pieces that went into making those images, starting with the one shot color camera. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break away here and do cutscenes because um, I've got a cough and I don't want to, I, I just got over uh, the cold and the flu and I don't want to be coughing midway through this. I need to take a break. I'll be right back. And next I have um, a reducer. You either need a reducer, which, which will make your, your field of view bigger, or you need a flattener because either one of those will give you, or should give you, round stars, edge to edge. I actually tried imaging without a flattener or reducer, just to see what would happen. And the stars on the edges, they looked so scary. They didn't look round. They practically looked like figure eights. They were, <laughs> they were really bad looking. So definitely uh, with the setup, um, get yourself um, a reducer or a flattener. In this case, this is the Orion 0.8 reducer, focal reducer. And uh, the flattener reducer would tell you how much space you need between the reducer and the camera sensor. And in this case, I would need um, 55 millimeters of space. Um, the phone's ringing off the hook today. And so um, you need 55 millimeters of space between. And so what I've got here are two spacers. Um, this is a 5 millimeter spacer and this is a 30 millimeter spacer. And so I'm going to put these together. Now you're thinking, well, where's the other 20 millimeters of space that I need? And the thing is, the camera sensor is really deep inside this camera, and it gives me the extra 20 millimeters of space that's already built in. So all I needed to do was add on 35 millimeters of space. So I'm going to screw this on here. Um, sometimes this gives me problems. I don't know why. It just doesn't thread on easily. Come on. You can do it. Hey, there it goes. Okay. And what I learned is you don't need to make this stuff super tight because if you do, you're only going to have problems getting it undone. Don't worry about making it super tight. You'll survive. I'm going to screw this on. Okay, so there's my camera, spacers, reducer. Now I use a light pollution filter. With my heavily light polluted skies, I need something. So um, I'm going to thread this on. This is an Optolong L Pro. And I'm going to thread it on. <coughs> Excuse me, see, I've got a cough. I'm not going to break away. I'm okay here. Um, and there we go. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add it as I'm going to actually put this on to my electronic moonlight focuser, this red part here. I use electronic focusers because um, I image all night. And if I do happen to lose the focus in the middle of the night, I don't want to be going outside trying to fix that. No way. I, I'd rather just have autofocus, checking the focus maybe every 45 minutes or an hour and readjusting it as needed. I, I will not image without an electronic focus. Um, even though my refractors 
they do hold focus pretty well, but still, uh, I, I'm used to, uh, I'm spoiled with electronic focusers. So what I'm going to do, and, and by the way, this uh, electronic focuser, when I bought it, I made a rookie mistake. This one has a compression ring that I can't remove. And um, I, with my primary setup, I avoid compression rings. I avoid anything that says self-centering because um, you're, when you're pointing low to the horizon um, as opposed to pointing high up, there, there's a bigger chance you might have image tilt in your imaging train. Um, it, it's, it's, it's tilt that, that can be caused. You, there's more of a chance when you have a, a compression ring or something that's self-centering. If, if the camera tilts a little bit, what you're going to see is the stars on one side of your picture might not look like the stars on the other side of the picture. They might be elongated, or in my case, they kind of look like Pac-Man shapes. It was really odd until I, someone clued me in the fact that maybe you should just thread your entire imaging train on instead of having the risk of, of a compression ring or self-centering that could still, that might cause tilt. Now you could still have a little bit of sag with if everything is threaded on, but the chances are a lot less likely than with the compression ring or, or something that's self-centering. And of course, um, um, if I was using, uh, if my imaging train was all threaded, I, 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 I wouldn't really be able to hang this, this filter threaded on. I would need the threads to thread it onto the focuser. So I would have to embed the light pollution filter somewhere probably inside this spacer here. I actually have another video on how to do that. I'll put a link if I can find it. So, um, so what you would do is you would just attach, whoops, the screw came out. So you would try to make these thumb screws as even as possible. Oh, this one came out too. I'm not going to worry about it for now. And that's that. That's the whole uh, enchilada. I've got the uh, a ZWO guide scope here and any camera that PHD2 can recognize would really suffice as a guide camera. I, I use a, on my primary setup, I use a Lodestar X2, but I wouldn't buy something so expensive again. You don't need it. Um, I, I've seen people get really good guiding results even with a planetary camera like the ASI 224MC, I, which I have a spare. I could use that as my, my guide camera. So, um, what else did I want to mention? Mm, I think that's it. I just wanted to show you this setup. I, so I, I'm still using it for solar, but I think, uh, I think I want to get a new mount and, and have this a one-shot color setup ready. I just don't know what mount to buy. Should I buy another CGX or is that too expensive? Should I go with the EQ6R mount? I don't know, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about that, but it'll be a learning curve. I'm so used to using the Celestron mounts, but I'd like to try something a little less expensive. And, and I heard good things about the EQ6R mount. So, um, anyway, that, 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 that's all I've got to share, folks. I will see you later, and thanks for listening. So if you just saw that Andromeda Galaxy um, that I a setup I had abandoned a couple years ago, and now I'm wondering why the heck did I abandon it? Yeah. Let's see. I've got a cloth. No, I don't have a cough.